Welcome in to the Modern Dealer Podcast, episode 013. My name is David Farmer with Entice, and with me at, as always, is David Burton Cheney. How you doing, sir? I am doing very well today. I do. Uh, I did come stocked, uh, stocked up with some uh, some of the Buddy Brew Bolt Cold Nitro Coffee, and I am wearing my Halloween socks. So ah. I am I am ready for for the season. I judge my seasons by whatever's at Cracker Barrel. So in, in July, Halloween was already up at Cracker yeah. Barrel. So. And my wife, if she heard me say that, she'd lose her mind. She says, don't tell anybody we got a cracker, bro. <laughs> well, it's better than using Sam's Club because I think it's either going to be summer or Christmas. I went to Sam's Club with my wife. I want to say it was probably three or four weeks ago at this point. So, I mean, it was in August and they had Christmas stuff all over the place. So it's either summer or Christmas at Sam's Club. I, I think it's already uh, Valentine's Day at yeah, Cracker Barrel coming is. up. <laughs> <laughs> it probably is. Well, um, interesting that you bring up um, Halloween because today is 013. Ooh. So I was actually thinking, do we do we want to do a 13th uh, episode? Do we want to do we, do we want to just do it like they do with uh, uh, um, buildings? With buildings and skip and skip, and skip yeah. uh, 13 and just go right to 14. Nah. I figured no. So last week it was, or was it last week? Zero two weeks two? two weeks ago? Zero one one. Um, zero, uh, yeah, zero one one, right. Uh-huh. One then one two. So zero one one was our Friday the 13th, the 13th. episode. Oh. Uh, so we did it for Friday the 13th um, this month, and we are rolling into. Um, rolling into October, so it's going to be Halloween. So again, another tie back to the 13th. Um, So I think this episode will be lucky number 13. Another 13 reference is um, new iOS 13 came out. Yeah, so we switched over to iOS 13. And um, I I just recently updated uh, my phone. I went from the 8 to the 11. Whoa. So I just got the 11. Fancy that. Yeah, fancy. Pro? Yeah, so this is the 11. Um, this is the uh, 11, 11 Pro. Pro Max. Pro Max. Yeah, so nice. it's a little bit bigger. So it's about the exact same size of uh, as the uh, uh, 8 Plus that I used to have. It actually fits inside, even though the camera doesn't. It fits inside my old case. I have some cases coming in. Uh, on order right now, so I have this out of the case, but uh, the camera is absolutely fantastic. Three of them. Um, I, I haven't played around with them too much, um, but what I have seen so far, pretty darn cool. And that actually that actually brings me... Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, no, this morning is funny. Is, you know, yep. I'm, I'm a YouTuber, so I do yep. uh, tune into a lot of good YouTube stuff, so I did watch the review that was only four days old, and it had already four million uh, views on the on that the 11, and it was a drop test. And the drop from waist high, shoulder high, not a crack, front, side, back, and back. Wow. And front and back, everything. They took it up on a 12-foot drop from a ladder, and of course it finally did yeah. crack. Uh, it cracked it, but it was actually when the iPhone hit the other iPhone is when it actually cracked. So the world's most, uh, the strongest glass is what uh, Apple's claiming that it has. It's the yeah. strongest glass out there. So it's pretty amazing. So I think you got a uh, an amazing product, and now I'm feeling a little jelly. So yeah, right. <laughs> it's time for me to go <laughs> I upgrade my. I went 30 Max. months. I went 30 wow. months with. So I skipped. Uh, I skipped a, a full generation for sure. But this uh, really is a. I mean, it's a, a, a unbelievable. And if you and if you haven't noticed, I am an Apple fanatic. You know, I have been for years and years and years. So I mean, this is definitely a fun day. <laughs> that, well, that's why I was a little shocked that you, that you skipped, skipped the whole generation. I, know. And I was like, man, you're usually all over it. Like you know. You, I would have expected, but yep. hey, you know, a little skip. It's a good skip. You got your 2020 model there rolling. Yep. In. And speaking of skipping, be sure not to skip and to subscribe to the Modern Dealer Podcast, which is also always available on YouTube. You may watch us on iTunes, Facebook, and of course, uh, you can follow us on ModernDealerPodcast.com. ModernDealerPodcast.com. So be sure to subscribe, turn on notifications. Ding. And don't forget us. Show us a lot of love. Yep. Hit us up in comments. Also, uh, share, like, and uh, check us out on LinkedIn. Yeah, and also if you spot. notice, I think it's up here and it's up there. Um, you're going to find our uh, Instagram uh, uh, profile links. Mm-hmm. And then underneath me and then underneath David, you're going to find Facebook, uh, Twitter, and Instagram where you can find us, please. Uh, if you have any interest in uh, learning a little bit more about the Modern Dealer podcast and what we do uh, day to day, please uh, check us out on other social media channels. 
So, rolling into 013. So, rolling into <laughs> 013. One of the reasons why I wanted to bring this up, uh, all, e- even though just oh. talking ball was pretty cool, was our main topic. So, our main topic this week, David, is the evolution of digital retailing. So, you now you start to come together. I know now you, you, it's you, coming you, together. I was asking about the slide. <laughs> I said, what, what is am I this? looking at? So, um, what we're going to be talking about today is the evolution of digital retailing. So, today in 2019, rolling into 2020, you say the term digital retailing uh, to somebody in automotive. It brings up this idea of somebody purchasing a vehicle online, either from a car dealership or a uh, a digital re- or a, a digital retailer such as Shift.com or Vroom.com or Carvana.com. Uh, but you know, going back in time, digital retailing might have brought up some other thoughts, uh, whether it's electronic commerce. um, And then also looking at the age of digital retailing outside of automotive. And that's where this uh, this image is going to come up. So what I'm sharing on my screen right now and I'll uh, share uh, up here right now is this company named Enjoy. So when I uh, so I ordered my phone on uh, AT&T uh, AT&T's website. Uh, so I was going to update my phone and my wife's phone. And as I'm going through the process and I get the phone picked out and I get it uh, get ready to set up uh, the delivery, it gave me two options for delivery. Mm-hmm. One option was to have it delivered to you know, the a- a- AT&T store so I can actually physically go to the store and I could pick up my phone. But the reason I was doing it online is I wanted to avoid going to the store because it's always this, you know, Circus. It's this big ordeal. It's a circus. You, you don't know how many people are going to be in front of you. You don't know how much time it's going to take. So I figured I'll just do it myself, get it sent directly to me, and not have to worry about it. So I had two options for delivery. Number one, go to the store. Number two, have it delivered to me today. So this was on Sunday. I'm, okay. so, so I'm sitting there having my coffee like I'm doing right now, right? <laughs> Uh, anyways, I'm sitting there having my coffee, <laughs> and uh, I'm going through, and I'm picking up the phone. I go for a delivery, and I go, well, I, I just I just want to deliver like Monday or Tuesday, whatever. That's fine. But they said, no, you can either go to a store or you can have it delivered to you that day. So it was like 11 o'clock in the morning, and the, the, the delivery slot was uh, between 2 and 4 that day on a Sunday. <laughs> That's I'm better going, than a cable guy. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? It's amazing. <laughs> between 8 and 5. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right? Uh, and, and and actually, the whole process worked out as, like, I got a text uh, uh, after I, I committed to uh, having it delivered to me because I thought about it, you know, I, I don't know if I really want somebody coming into my home and delivering a product to me on a Sunday, but then I thought, well, wouldn't it be a cool... Um, uh, w- wouldn't it be cool to go through this experience and to be able to share it with the viewers of the Modern Dealer podcast? So that's the reason I opted in for it, um, to really see how other com- uh, other companies are utilizing uh, digital retailing and uh, just kind of go through that experience. And I wanted to share that with everybody because I think this might be a model of where digital retailing and automotive is going. So anyways... I order the phone. I pick uh, between 2 and 4 o'clock. That was the, the, the time slot that they had to have it delivered out to me. Um, and uh, a, I got a, a text confirmation. I got an email confirmation. Uh, one of the texts was, hey, I might be able to get there a little bit sooner, uh, and you'll be able to get a tighter time window as the time approaches. So I got an email saying uh, between, I think it was 2.30 and 3. And then he was there right at about 3 o'clock. And uh, so it's from this company named Enjoy. Uh, So Enjoy is a company that offers product delivery to consumers for companies. Right now, I think they're doing business for um, AT&T. They're doing business for some of the Google uh, home electronics, uh, uh, smart home electronics, uh, Sonos. So they'll come out and they'll uh, do the installation for uh, Sonos speakers, wireless speakers as well. Uh, so you can buy it online. They'll deliver the product. And then when they when they come out, I was chatting with the guy. And what he said was, I asked him about the company and what he does. I uh, just get a little bit more uh, insight uh, to what he's doing is uh, their goal as a company is to bring the in-store experience mobile to the consumer. Right. 
So they have an iPad. So if you've been into an AT&T store, and I'm sure it's the same for other companies as well, right. but uh, they have a, an iPad that they use. So they have access to the AT&T entire network. system, the network, right. and you know everything that a consumer, a, 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 a store, a, a store rep would have. Uh, they can you know go through my account if I wanted to see if there's any ways to you know save money, look at different programs or whatever. And they have ability, and they bring out other products. They had, he said, he had you know. You know, dozens of phones in his in his car. Had a whole bunch of accessories. You know, an Apple Watch. Um, he brought out with them. So it was kind of a cool experience uh, to have have it delivered that fast. You know, within a couple hours of ordering it from AT and T, somebody was there, and I was on my new phone. So that's pretty cool. That's pretty strong because I mean, the the how fast that process was. Like you said, Sunday morning, yeah. you're just you know messing around looking for a Tuesday delivery. Yeah, take it today. Faster than they can install cable or yeah. something like that. That requires uh, it seems to it seems to require a whole lot more yeah. logistics to it. But to bring it out to you to give you the in store yeah. experience in your living room mm-hmm. or your dining room table, yeah. then that makes a lot of sense to me. I'm down. Yeah. I'm so th- so to answer your question you had earlier, that's that is, is that's who that is. That's wondering. my uh, my dining room table. Uh, <laughs> I was right like, there. uh, there's a strange <laughs> picture of some guy yeah. and uh, a phone on the on the on the podcast. But no, that makes sense because you, you got to think about the the days of delivery. So anywhere you go now, from McDonald's to Taco Bell to yeah. you know all the fast food places have got it covered. Yeah, um, they've they're on board with Uber Eats mm-hmm. or Bite Squad. I mean, every restaurant's with Bite yeah. Squad. Everybody's got some form of delivery. Mobile experience is like, you know, if your phone broke, say you were getting your phone repaired. Well, they have the guys that come out to the house and repair it for you. I mean, they'll, they'll have a little van right outside. They'll come yeah. in. They'll like, okay, let me take your phone. And they'll just like if you went to, you know, the iPhone doctor, uh, right. the iPhone uh, clinic, they call them mm-hmm. around here. If you did that, I mean, they brought this whole experience to you. Same with this. I mean, bringing the experience to the front door. And now I see how this all segues with our digital, on digital retailing, the evolution of digital retailing, right? Yes, sir. So it's the idea of, you know, bringing that retail experience to you or, you know, at least updating it to what consumers are expecting today. Um and uh, the next slide I wanted to share is just a, 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 a quick photo of an e-pencil worksheet. Um, the reason I bring this up is that, you know, I really look at, you know, digital retailing, uh, electronic commerce um, is something that is not new. And this kind of reminds me of that. So this was, you know, I created this product, you know, back in the late uh in late 1999, early 2000, I delivered it and partnered with the Cardone Group to bring ePencil to the marketplace. It was the first desking solution of its type. Uh, that worksheet that you're looking at right there is exactly the same as it was when I created it in 1999. And really the goal of this was to be able to provide transparency into the car buying purchase process and really make it easier for customers to buy cars and salespeople to sell cars. Um, I developed this uh, initially as a tool for a business development center. Uh, my business development center, our BDC, back in uh, the uh, the, Sutherland, the, the days. Sutherland Toyota days. You know, we took all of the incoming sales calls. We took, uh, at the time, the, uh, the uh, inbound internet leads. Um, and we had other ways of engaging with consumers unsold showroom follow-up. And our goal really was to utilize the BDC to support the sales department and the service department. Um, but uh, but do that by providing transparency, and we were very successful. You know, we were selling uh, or two hundred, I would say, uh, upwards of two to three hundred deals would be filtered through uh, uh, our BDC back in the day. Out of six, so like half of the deals going to be filtered through the BDC somehow, whether it's an incoming sales call or uh, uh, following up on unsold showroom traffic um, or uh, internet leads or any other leads that we are getting in. So the reason I'm bringing this up is really, I, I look at digital retailing as really kind of providing transparency into the process, utilizing you know, uh, computers, utilizing digital uh, to engage in retailing activities. Um, so it's uh, digital retailing is not something that is new, but is really kind of 
I think it's really starting to find its uh, foothold, and I think consumers have been asking for it for a long time, and I think dealers and other retailers are kind of find, finally catching up with, you know, kind of what was started back in the late 90s, uh, early 2000s um, with that. So another, pro another reason I wanted to bring this, uh, this product up is that, uh, um, uh, so I've really created uh, a handful of products uh, that I've brought to the automotive space. My newest product, DealMaker, is a digital retailing application. So we're going to be talking a little bit about a product that I've brought to the marketplace and my company, Entice, works with a lot of dealers. It ties in extremely well with our conversation that we had with Sam Robbie last week mm -hmm. where we were talking about um, utilizing these digital retailing fundamentals at his dealership. And um, we've been uh, pioneering DealMaker at Branded Honda over the last year and a half uh, or so. Uh, maybe it's almost been two years now since we've been uh, utilizing our technology there and, and getting a lot of great success with it. Um, so I wanted to kind of kind of bring that together is that the idea of digital retailing is not new, but it, it has had uh, an evolution. And that's uh, why we're looking at the evolution of digital uh, retailing. Um, so what we're going to do, be, since this is kind of a good time right now, about 15, 16 minutes uh, into our first segment, and we're going to try to get this uh, into two segments uh, uh, this time, uh, we're going to go ahead and start uh, or go ahead and take our first break, and uh, we're going to come back in and get into our, our, our main topic. How's that sound? Sounds like a Kit Kat. All right, be back in a little <laughs> bit. researching this topic, I want to kind of go back in time a little bit. And that's why we're looking at an article that's over three years old, March 28th, 2016. Um, uh, this is an automotive news article. Another batch of Silicon Valley startups take takes on car retailing. So in this article, they're looking at a few different companies, including BP, Vroom, Carvana, Roadster, Drive Motors, um, in this article. And so I'm including the link here to that, but there's a, a couple key pieces that I wanted to uh, to talk about and, and really the evolution. So some of the main companies that they've talked about, BP. Now, I don't know if you knew this, but BP is no longer. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah I've never even heard of them. I'm like, yeah. BP, I'm like, am I saying that right? Yeah. So <laughs> if, 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 uh, if I remember correctly, and I didn't do a lot of research on BP as far as their business model, but I think one of the things that they were trying to do is not only were they looking at buying vehicles and holding them, they were looking really to be um, uh, a, a, a company that would take a vehicle on consignment and then sell it. So mm. they're going to just be the technology that was going to be the intermediary between a seller and a buyer. Kind of what Carvana is saying that they want to be is they want to be, um, you know, the company that's going to be kind of in the middle to work uh, to facilitate the consumer, transaction consumer between transaction. consumer transaction. Yep, consumer mm -hmm. to consumer transaction, which we talked about uh, in uh, episode 012 with, uh, with Sam. So BP, um, one of the things, actually, since we're talking about them, let me uh, open up and go down to uh, that article there. Which one was it? Hold on a sec. Sorry. Uh, Forbes. Yes. Okay. So this is, yeah. So failed startup. And, I, and I'm not picking on BP. I think it's very cool that they're trying to innovate uh, in this space. I think what we can take away from this from uh, a dealer perspective is that uh, outside people, people outside the automotive industry are looking at our industry and saying, hey, what? You know what? you're not doing it right. There's opportunity for me to innovate in this space. Uh, just really shows that uh, us as car dealers uh, have the opportunity to do a better job and uh, to facil facilitate uh, transactions for or customers. And I, and I think ultimately car dealers will win. Um, I think that we have a great 
uh, group of entrepreneurs in the automotive dealer space. I mean, I've met so many innovative uh, people in this industry that I think ultimately we will win. We just need a little assistance, I think, in getting there. But the reason I wanted to bring up this article is um, uh, how incredibly fast BP was running through cash. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Seven million a month. Seven million dollars a month that they were losing. So they raised $149 million on what was uh, a $560 million evaluation of the company at its high point, and they ended up shuttering their company in 2016. Um, they did try to sell off their assets and their, their infrastructure uh, to a couple different vendors, including um, uh, Fair.com. Fair mm -hmm. DG, DG, DG out of uh, San Francisco area, and I think another technology company as well, but was unsuccessful. Um, but $149 million that they were able to raise, and that's kind of a drop in the bucket. And that's a couple of things that we want to talk about today as well. So I'm going to pop back up to this digital retailing, another batch of Silicon Valley startups taking on car retailing. Um, so talking about Roadster, I think Roadster is doing a very good job of bringing a very mature product to car dealers. I personally think that the perspective that they're bringing to uh, their product to dealers isn't quite uh, on, it, it, I don't think it's connecting correctly with dealers, and I, and I think that they're have, their dealers are having challenges uh, delivering on the expectations. So. What I mean by that is Roadster's uh, uh, perspective is to facilitate the entire purchase transaction online. So you find a vehicle on a dealership's website, which is actually a Roadster website uh, that's um, uh, on a subdomain from your existing dealership website. So you're ultimately having two vehicle display pages, two search results pages on your dealership website. One really is just the uh, the technology that Roadster is supplying. And the process is to have the customer go through the purchase process online, uh, which I think some consumers may think they want, but ultimately they're not getting a lot of people going through the entire transaction and facilitating. And I, and I know that talking about this, you were talking to somebody uh, in this marketplace that was using a competitive par uh, product uh, through Drive Motors, mm -hmm. which is another Silicon Valley company that's bringing uh, a transaction software to car dealers, and they're kind of running into the same hurdles, correct? So, Well, I was going to actually go back to, to last uh, episode and talk about what Sam said is, you know, what could... What could a dealer do nowadays is either they be 100% digital like a Carvana, which, you know, or, um, you know, be brick and mortar. Sam said, which, you know, I believe is the best version was a hybrid version yep. of it to have both, you know, both a, you know, a digital online experience that with DealMaker, basically that takes you through the entire process. And what AutoNation tried to do in 2015, but failed miserably was have that type of experience for consumers to be able to buy a vehicle, reserve it through PayPal, um, you know, put some money down on a vehicle. But it, it, I don't think I think that's where the shortcomings came with AutoNation. To get back to basically the the digital retailing portion of this, customers still want to have an interaction, like you had said last week, with the whole thing is like, maybe you know, hundred percent online, zero percent salesman. We still want to deal with the salesperson because they want them to be. Like one of these articles I said, like referred to as like a product genius, yep. like an Apple Store experience, which you can buy. You know, I get a new MacBook, and I had my new this MacBook actually delivered to the Apple Store, so they would actually help me set it up and facilitate and everything like that. And that was, or I could have had it delivered to my house. Yep. I chose the Apple Store with an appointment. Yeah. You don't dare walk in an Apple Store yeah, without right. an appointment, <laughs> <laughs> especially the one over here in International. But I mean. That experience is what I had needed in order to take on this new MacBook. Just like a customer buying a brand new, a brand new vehicle right. nowadays with all the technologies in there, they're going to want that experience both digitally to save themselves the time, and then come into the store basically for uh, an express delivery as AutoNation tried to do, but they failed. Yeah. So one of the things that uh, we we are trying to do is really to. And actually, let me take. I'm going to step back uh, a moment and come back to this thought. So, 
What I'm going to go back to is in this article, 2016, the CEO, Andy Moss of Roadster, um, his quote was, we want to deliver a real e-commerce experience, uh, Moss said, not just a portal that brings you into the old business model. So his goal with Roadster was to create a new e-commerce experience. Now, back then in 2016, they were selling cars. Mm -hmm. They were not a software as a service company. Uh, they actually started with a, uh, a, a broker out of the San Francisco, uh, Silicon Valley area that was facilitating uh, car purchases. And I think you mentioned his name. Christopher uh, Gross. Yep. During yeah. the break. Harvard, a Harvard graduate yeah. with a business, you know, uh, you know, finance veteran with a business degree in it. But I mean, yeah. yeah, so they used his business and read this article if you want to learn a little bit more about the beginnings of that. But they wanted to uh, leverage that model, but bring it into an e-commerce experience, but to avoid the dealership. So it was going to be a dealership replacement solution, just like Carvana, Vroom, BP, Shift, uh, these other companies that are in the space. Uh, now, they found out, and uh, what, what they said during the article, that they skinned their needs a few times. They learned that selling cars is hard. Uh, <laughs> it's not an easy thing. You just can't say, hey, it should be a simple deal, which we know in automotive, right? It's not yeah. simple. Yeah, they, yeah. Said they, they said that they got beat up in, yeah. the, in the beginning of dealing this because they came from a, f a fashion yeah. background. They had sold, they had did two startup fashion companies, did well, sold them off, yeah. and they said, oh, you know, yeah. they had, he had a bad experience yeah. trying to buy a Mercedes, and yeah. he wound up getting a BMW because it took so long yeah. for him to complete the transaction. But yeah, you you had to, they had to actually become a dealer before they can say, hey, you know, let me actually, you know, be a, be a, a player before I'm actually a coach. Yeah. So they uh, were able to, as they were trying to grow their business, I think, I don't know uh, when they decided or why they decided to make this transition, but they did pivot from a online retailer into a software as a service uh, solution provider to automotive dealerships. So they bring that e-commerce uh, experience uh, to de de uh, dealerships. Now, I think where um, there's opportunity for many, especially new car dealers, uh, but uh, independent used car dealerships as well, is to be able to provide a hybrid approach. So um, he's saying they want to deliver an e a real e-commerce system, not just a portal to, that brings uh, a customer into the old business model. Now, DealMaker, we're actually embracing that old business model. We're trying to create a technology that uh, that that uh, that. Um, transitions a customer from what they're doing online to what they're doing offline in the dealership showroom. So we're providing the customer the ability to walk through every single step that they and they can choose which pieces they want to complete, but they're able to walk through every piece. And really, I think the difference is, is we are providing a shopping platform versus other companies like Roadster or Drive Motors. They're trying to provide a purchase transaction software. So I think it's that perception, that, that distinction, is that we're going to supply shopping activities, deal exploration activities, right. that's going to feed into the dealership showroom to make it easier, faster, um, and giving the customer the ability to do that that shopping experience. It's a trust thing. Yes. It boils down to trust because the customer still is skeptical on, like, do I really want to finish this transaction all online to make the second largest purchase of their life? I mean, can you completely buy a house online as of now? I don't think you can. So an automobile should be the same way. I look at this like, uh, like Sam has said, like a hybrid. I look at it just like, think of your dealership like an Apple store. Apple stores will never go away. Right. Because people still need that human experience to show them like, hey, take me through setting up my, you know, my content, my email on, on this new uh, MacBook. Same thing is going to be with it with this dealer model moving forward as a modern dealer to be a hybrid dealer that can do the digital shopping, complete your transaction in the store, or if necessary, if like I, I mentioned in the last uh, the last episode, I had a customer for twenty plus yep. years that would always just call me, hey, this is what I want, you know, send me the information on it, and I'll write you a check, and we would deliver the vehicle always to his house. Uh, just like this uh, Christopher Gross was doing. He was dealing with billionaires on billionaire block in San yep. Francisco and was delivering for an $800 fee, basically, to these billionaires. 
for that experience. Yep. So really, it's not a one size fits all approach, mm -hmm. right? So Carvana has a couple different options, but it is you know supposedly 100% online. All there is there, although there is a person on the other end of the phone, other end of the the the, the chatting device um, that is going to facilitate uh, the actual per, uh, purchase. Um, so Drive Motors, uh, as we kind of transition through here, let's talk about a couple other people in the space. Drive Motors, they raised 1.5 million dollars in capital from blue chip uh, venture capital firms. Um, they also uh, had a additional, uh, many additional um, uh, equity uh, raises. Um, so the reason I wanted to bring up some of those numbers is the to let people know the ty type of money that consumers or that um, Wall Street is investing into uh, some of these uh, different companies. Um, Lithia, they injected $54 million into a used car ar uh, upstart uh, last month, this was last year in uh, 2018, becoming the largest investor in a company named Shift. Uh, so Shift.com is a is a, another company that's very similar to Carvana. They're an online retailer. I think they are limited in where they are operating at this point. I think mostly in uh, a few um, a few uh, uh, cities inside of California. Although, uh, being that they had a, a large investment uh, from Lithia, I'm sure that they're, uh, they're, they're utilizing many of the Lithia stores uh, to be able to facilitate uh, deliveries, car purchases, uh, and so on. So there's another company that's out there. Um, they have raised, uh, as of 2019, $300 million uh, total, $54 million um, specifically from Lithia. Uh, and they are planning on uh, following Carvana to an IPO in 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, so there might be an exit strategy there for, for Lithia. Um, but uh, some, some other large investments in the space, one that you mentioned a little while ago, um, was AutoNation. Uh, yep. Uh, they, they invested, or they at least set aside, uh, to invest $100 million uh, in what they called digital storefronts. And you kind of walked through what that process where, uh, was, where a customer can leave a deposit on PayPal, they can reserve the car, um, and then they can complete and finish the remaining paperwork uh, at the dealership. One of the pieces I think that they were missing in their digital retailing is they didn't really, didn't really allow uh, customers to go through all of the pieces of the car buying experience, such as getting a, a trade value online, uh, looking at different uh, lease payments, loan payments, finance products, you know, doing everything in one a, a consistent package like we do with our DealMaker product. Um, so they can basically do as much as they want and just finish it with a phone call, a conversation, a test drive. It was so where they failed, because I was a new car manager yep. for AutoNation at that time, and where the failure came in, it was just basically, it was just a, a place to put a deposit on a car. Yeah. It was like, okay, I got that car reserved. If you didn't come in within three days, then you got your deposit back, and the car went back on the market. So, And it was just, mostly it was just new cars, and occasional used car was in there. But it, the, the, the message as working at the dealership at the time try and understand like well you know if you're just going to reserve it wouldn't it be better if the customer because mostly the customers would come in and they still have to do the trade evaluation right and you know for stores that didn't adopt to putting trade evaluation up front right and the customer first came in and was like okay so you're on the clock for 30 minutes you know we're supposed to get this guy in and out so we need to start with the trade evaluation the car they picked out was just basically pulled up front just like if you know you and i were selling cars back in the 90s and the customer said hey you know, you got a white Corolla CE left, and I'm like, yeah, I got one out there. It's one 1998 left, brand new. And I would run out, grab the keys. I would, I, you know, we'd, we'd hide the car, right? Right. We'd yeah. take the car, hide it behind yeah. detail. I'm like, all right, nobody else is going to get the car. I got the keys in my pocket. Nobody can sell the car. Well, it's just the same thing that AutoNation tried to do, but they weren't able, like you said, to see their payments, see the yeah. lease options, get a, a full trade evaluation. Yeah. They just Apply had for credit, do all the pieces. Yeah, they just had it kind of sprinkled in and just yeah. like, well, we'll just kind of hide the car for them, you know, online and just say, okay, this car's got a deposit on it, which may create some urgency for other buyers, but at the end of the day, it fell flat because yeah. the dealership, the execution at the store is where it miserably failed at. And then, of course, I mean, it was a failure in both halves, failure online, without the options and a failure at the store because 
It just it, yeah. it didn't it didn't go so, over well. So what this really reminds me of too, when we talked about the Google um, Think Auto event for 2019, uh, somebody from uh, Chrysler um, Global was talking about his experience with purchasing and doing research for a Tesla, Tesla yeah. and a uh, Alfa Romero. Yep. And spent 13 hours or something online researching, picking out colors, equipment, getting everything all configured the way that they wanted to configure it on AlfaRomero.com. And he went to the dealership just like, <laughs> what? What are you talking here. about? <laughs> where, 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 and that, that's kind of what I experienced, you know, back. Um, you got your Audi. It, it, well, no, b- back in auto uh, retail is when C- uh, companies like AutoNation were trying this, you know, use a PayPal to reserve the vehicle. It's like, well, who had it? Where's it going? Is it is the car sold? Is it not co- sold? When the customer mm-hmm. came in, they might have been expecting an expedited uh, experience, but it wasn't connecting to what was actually happening in the dealership showroom. I see and hear the same thing um, from other digital retailing technologies is where customers are doing the work thinking that they're going through and purchasing a vehicle, but that information isn't being translated into the dealership. And this whole idea that you're going to have, you know, a special people that's going to be handling the transaction at the dealership, you know, isn't, you know, they're not, uh, 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 they're, they're not embracing the process that the technology is saying that you need to, to, to utilize. Mm-hmm. And we're coming in from, from a different angle. We're saying, okay, we're, we're going to take the existing dealership process and we're going to push it into what's happening uh, on the, the dealership's website. Mm-hmm. So what they do, and as we create a lead, it f- it, it, tr- it transparently, f- tra- transparently flows into an existing process. So it's easy for a salesperson to engage with the customer based on the different pieces with the trade and the lease and the incentives and all of those pieces, Uh, but it's not creating a new process. And I think that, you know, I'm lucky enough that I've had 20 plus years in automotive retail. I've sold cars, I've managed dealerships. I mean, I have that experience that I'm able to wrap, you know, to, to use the basis to wrap my technology around. So that's kind of our goal is to create this hybrid approach. Um, another thing is uh, Tesla, I think, is kind of looking at, uh, you know, a, a, a different process. Um, that is also a disruptor in the space and a digi- an evolution of digital retailing is that uh, they're they're bypassing the dealer, right? Well, they didn't they try that for two weeks and they shut it down. Yeah, yeah, they're going to we're going to one hundred percent online and are like, uh, yeah. that's not going to yeah. work. Yeah, they I'm, need to have that that personal interaction, right? They have to have that interaction. Yeah. Of course, people still need. They're, it's a learning for for the market. Yeah, people need to understand the EVs. Uh, the, you know, this electric vehicle. They need to understand it a lot better to be more comfortable with it to say, hey. I'm okay buying this thing 100% online. Um, it, it, it's kind of funny is is the maturity. Um, when all these companies that had failed, that had tried digital retailing years ago, and it didn't, it just it failed, is because the maturity of the consumer right. wasn't there yet. Mm-hmm. The trust factor. Amazon has yep. changed the way that we think about buying things. Yep. Um, and, and has kind of added a level of comfort. I don't, I don't know if, I, I, a company like Enjoy delivering phones and technology to somebody's house, I don't know if that would have succeeded five years ago. I think we've kind of evolved in the last five to eight years on what we, what our expectations are, what, what, we're, what we would allow to happen. Right. And, and they came to your house. They mm-hmm. did this whole tra- you know uh, experience with yeah. your phone. And if the dealership could bring test drives to the house, yeah. which you know we, we advertise that, but also the purchase transaction, you, if you completed everything and it's a, if your state allows for you to go deliver this vehicle to this customer's house, it's a brand new vehicle, then then why not do it? Yep. And, and, you know, people complain these dealerships are, are uh, like, you know, the Hyundai Assurance where a lot of Hyundai dealerships are failing is because they just don't have the staff. It even says on a commercial yep. we're available, yep. you know, if uh, uh, dealership staffing allows is yep. something that one of the disclosures they use in the commercial they're using for the Hyundai Assurance. But simply, it's just think about it. Like, well, use your dealer trade guy to follow your salesperson yeah. to the house. I mean, how much of a challenge is that? Pay the guy hundred bucks, you're done. Yeah, uh, you don't even need to hire somebody. You got this, you know, this outsourced person already helping you out already. If worst case, Uber home. Yeah, <laughs> Uber back to the store. Yeah, and as we. Um as we start to wrap up episode 013, I think we were able to get through a lot of a uh, uh, lot, lot of information today. I think that the challenge for dealers today and the big takeaway is 
I think they need to decide where their comfort level is in how they want to evolve. If you don't evolve as a dealer, you're going to die. We know that, that you are going to have to embrace this thing that we're calling digital retailing. How you embrace it, I think, um, is going to determine your level of success moving forward. And I think some of the things that I would challenge dealers to really start to think about is, um, the the different pieces that you could digitize on your dealership website. And from my perspective, number one, I would want to make sure that a customer has the ability to get a trade value. And if not an exact trade value, at least providing transparency into how that trade evaluation is uh, the, how, how the process works in giving a customer an idea uh, based on uh, some of those pieces, meaning a book value and giving a customer kind of a range. And then they can decide where they feel that vehicle is going to land in there. Of course, the vehicle is going to have to be uh, physically appraised no matter what. So it can't be 100% online anyway. So it's going to have to be uh, a, you know, a physical uh, interaction. Uh, another section of that is being able to provide transparency into uh, the calculation of the deal itself, including full taxes and fees, all of the incentives, rebates, special financing, uh, the ability to look at retail payments, loan payments, um, lease payments, all the different types of lease payments, uh, and be able to kind of explore you know how different things affect that. Well, what if I wanted to go 72 months? What if I wanted to go 66 months? What if I wanted to put zero down? What if I wanted to put a thousand dollars down, two thousand dollars down? So, um, a quick break, and I want to wrap up with that thought is, but that's the same thing that we were doing back with ePencil in the day, is giving those customers the exploration options, and mm -hmm. we found that it was extremely effective. Uh, where we have customers coming in already, ex you know, with their explored options circled. I want to yep. buy this car, w you know, with that circled payment. Um, but also, even moving past that into F and I products, full transparency, what F and I products you, th that you're providing, and, a and to provide uh, the customer the ability to learn about those different products. Is is there some video content that somebody could watch? Mm -hmm. Can you link out to uh, the product provider's website to provide more information? If we provide information, customers are going to see value, and then once they see value in that, they're going to be able to justify making that purchase. Um, we talked about when we uh, we talked about uh, how successful a uh, Apple is with Apple Care from a cost standpoint <laughs> yeah. because the customers see value in it. Same thing yeah. with vehicle service contracts and gap insurance <laughs> and prepaid maintenance. There's value there, uh, but the customer needs to be able to explore that themselves. And then wrapping up with other kind of nuts and bolts types of activities that need to be digitized, which is, uh, you know, filling out a credit application online, uh, scheduling a vehicle, uh, scheduling an appointment at the dealership. Um, those are other pieces. Um, and then also some other pieces of digital retailing that you should be able to have inside your solution is the ability for the customer to find out what their credit score is so they mm -hmm. can accurately estimate what their payment is. You want to be able to give the customer the ability to look up their, their, their payoff on their existing vehicle so they don't have to go outside, call somebody, you, right. know, you know, figure out what they owe on it or just guess. So I think that really truly is the evolution of digital retailing is giving the customer choices, mm -hmm. giving the customer full transparency into the process and give, it, give them good deal exploration and shopping tools. Uh, so that's what we're trying to do with DealMaker. Um, I think that Hyundai is doing a very good di uh, job with their shopper assurance program where you can schedule an appointment, you can schedule a test drive to go home, a test drive to go at your work, uh, you can schedule a test drive at the dealership. Um, so there's a lot of good uh, uh, opportunity from a lot of different customer uh, companies out there. I, nobody's got it figured out right now. We're definitely um, in the evolution of this thing called digital retailing. Uh, so that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Any last thoughts that you have, David, before we get this wrapped up? I think of this model as the year 2000. When the Prius came out, that was the ugliest thing I've ever seen in my yeah. life, and it was hard to, to swallow that, tell a customer, this is a great idea. Um, as a dealer, I can just see dealers seven, five, six, seven years ago thinking that, 
digital retailing that oh you can't sell a car yeah. online for them to evolve to that now and they have the ability to uh, have a hybrid version yeah. going on today and you know make that that delivery at home an option for a customer to give them that option like hey this is either going to be you know come to the store and pick it up or we'll deliver it to you that should be that should be what you could evolve to right now to take something an action from this episode right now is to be able to give that option to your to your customers and and um, you know put it out there train your salespeople on it yes. so salespeople understand it because salespeople they're gonna take the path of least resistant so if you're gonna give them the option like hey let's cheat let's go right on to this you know um, purchase shopping experience help the customer get their trade value and, and their payoff help them out be that customer advocate that we have you know that salesperson in the store it's gonna be the hundred percent customer advocate yeah. they're gonna latch right onto this new process or this process with a couple tweaks to it and help you know deliver deliver more cars in the end it's gonna kind of kill that race to the bottom of like hey we need to be the lowest price now you're offering a better service yeah. and people to the will customer. pay for experience they'll pay for experience just like we discovered with Carvana they'll take a car that's got some dings and scratches and is a little bit dirty for a better experience yeah in the words of Forrest Gump that's all I've got to say about that.